Dead Child Duo podcast episode number 51 with the VHS recording of Alex. It's not a VHS recording, but (laughs) the webcam was coming in a little bit choppy initially, but it seems to have subsided. It's classic Discord. You gotta love it. Uh, So how are you doing, Andy? Uh, You know, my my usual, uh, you know. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think the choppiness is back, so we're back to VHS quality. I, mean, I actually you know, saw somebody's YouTube video the other day. No offense to the guy. I won't mention his name because I wouldn't want to embarrass anybody, but he was doing a like a full on like he was recording with a camera and um it looked like it was shot at about fifteen frames a second. So it had like this very old school nineties vibe to it. No idea if that's intentional or not though. Uh so you uh, cut out how many frames a second? It looked like it was going on for about uh, 15 frames a second, basically. Like, it was very, very, very choppy. And, like, Chris Duckman does his videos in 24 because he does movie reviews and movies are in 24 frames. Yeah, I've heard that 24 will give you kind of that that cinematic feel. And then I've seen people actually turn on 24 frames a second in the middle of a video, like, even like a vlog, and it feels kind of more movie like than 60 or 30 would. So. I don't know. Maybe your brain's kind of tuned into that. Then Gemini Man, the new movie, was like 200 frames a second. It was like oh, really? ridiculous. That is pretty ridiculous. Because I think your eye pretty much stops seeing after 60. I mean, like, I know some people can see a little bit above 60. Like, I, I, I've even heard claims that it goes up to one. Oh, you got to run Fortnite in 100 frames per second or you're a bum. Uh, you know, there are competitive advantages to running at a higher frame rate, but I don't know if there's really any visual advantage to running at like a super high frame rate. I get that 2000 Hertz monitor. Yeah. I don't really want to talk about super low latency monitors. Cause every time somebody brings that up, it reminds me of this one person who would DM me endlessly. And if you're a longtime follower of my channel, you know who I'm talking about. Rest in peace. Yeah. And, (laughs) you know, would DM me endlessly about PCs and specs. And like, at one point I told the guy, I'm like, listen, I don't want to help you out anymore because you're literally going on eBay and lowballing people on PC prices. Like there was a PC that he looked at, which by the way, the, the, the specs were amazing. This was like a $1,500 PC, and the guy had used it for a month. Now, everybody knows the minute you open that thing up, the minute it's, it's this way with computer parts. The minute you open it up and you use it, the price goes down. So the guy had it listed for $1,100, which was like totally fair. And he's like, I'm going to offer him $600. I was like, you know what, dude? We're done. <laughs> like, I'm not going to help you lowball people. That's really kind of scummy. Anyway, Andy, what have you been watching slash playing this week? Uh, playing, I played a game of Madden. Maybe no, maybe not. I had my bye week in the franchise, so maybe I played a game of Madden, maybe I didn't. I don't remember. Okay. And that's it. Uh, watching wise, I've been watching some, a lot of Cinemassacre. Okay. Which we never usually talk about YouTube, but I'm watching a lot of throwbacks and massacre videos. It's a great channel. Um. I watched a, one episode of a TV show called Insatiable on Netflix, and that show is awful. Okay. And then I watched Funny Games, Taurus Trap, Trilogy of Terror, The Cat of Nine Tales, Palooka, Tales from Tales of Halloween. I rewatched the original DC Film Club pick, They Live, and then this week's pick, The Last Exorcism. That's a pretty good one. Um, by the way, Cinemassacre. I routinely go through like, by the way, it's a great channel. I encourage everybody to check it out, but like, there's so much content on there. I can go on there at any given time and find videos that I've never even seen before. Like that. I've just, I missed it or whatever. So really cool content creators. Um, gotta, you know, I think most content creators would aspire to be that good. Uh, they live, does it still hold up? Huh? They live? Does it still hold oh, up? Oh, yeah. yeah. I thought you were talking about Sin Massacre, and I was like, no. what? No, their old videos still hold up, definitely. <laughs> like, no, even, I meant, even like, though, no yeah. you went like, you went like, they live. I know. Like, you're... Bad segue. I was like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> they live what? Yeah. Well, you were much busier than I was, 
that's for tr- that's for real. Um, so anyway, uh, this week I've been playing a lot of Madden. Uh, did house rules this week, and that was quite the grind. You had to win thirty five house rules games, even though. Um, and again, here comes the choppiness again. It's it's one hundred percent Discord at this point. Uh, so it was thirty five games, even though they were like shorter games. It was still quite the grind. So um, that took a while to do. And then um, how many it, days did you have? It was a seventy two hour thing. So it was good that they did that. I was really happy to see that they gave us three days instead of two, because originally I thought, oh man, I'm gonna have to get thirty five wins in two days. That's gonna be well, quite the crunch what weekend league and fifa's 40 games i know i don't know how people do that i i seriously have no clue i i saw people talking about fifa weekend league recently um i put in a, a decent amount this week on weekend league did one stream on it played a lot offline didn't finish all 25 games i just couldn't make it happen i had stuff going on you know this weekend just it just didn't happen um plus i was a little bit burnt out you know like you play house rules you got to get 35 wins. It was really good. Got a lot of coins, got a lot of good players out of it. I ended up getting enough coins to get three mutt heroes. So it was pretty good. Oh man. What? (laughs) That's a lot. I mean, those are the best cards in the game right now. So, I mean, it, it works out. So I've been playing that, um, world of Warcraft as well. I haven't streamed it. I've had some people ask me to come back to streaming it, so that'll probably happen soon. And I finally unlocked the ability to fly in the Battle for Azeroth areas, which if you don't play World of Warcraft, that doesn't seem like a big deal. But when I tell you, yeah, it takes months of time, months of time. So I finally like fully unlocked it. I think last week I was still doing some mop up. Like I had a couple things, quest lines that I had to do, did all that, um, really happy about that and then uh that's about it i i played a little bit of nes stuff on switch as usual because it's just a really cool perk of having a nintendo online and then as far as watching uh finished lost in space so last week i was like i think 60 percent done with it i did watch the last four episodes my god the writing got really sloppy like I still like the show and I still think there's potential there. And I don't know if they're doing a second season or not. I'm, I'm assuming they will, but yeah, since Netflix original, they usually do two or three. Well, yeah, but sometimes they do one and it just doesn't work out. You know, like that's happened before with Netflix originals that I've, that I've been watching. I mean, it's happened for the great TV shows like freaks and geeks. That's a good example of a show that probably deserved more than one season. I mean, I always look at TV shows and go Bob's burgers, one of my favorite animated shows, period. And I think it's really funny and really witty and it's great humor. And I like that it kind of breaks up the monotony of all the Seth MacFarlane animated stuff that's out there because it's great, but it's a lot of Seth MacFarlane. You know, that almost got canceled after one season. You know, like it, you, you can easily ha- be one and done. So uh, Lost in Space, I, I liked it through the first half. The second half, you could have told me they were different writers because it was a totally different tone and different way of approaching the story that I, I didn't really care for too much. I went back and um, Best Buy had a steel book for Beetlejuice, the movie from, I guess the late eighties, early nineties. I forget exactly when it was made. 80s. Yeah. Uh, me and my wife watched that cause she's a big fan of the movie and we've put off buying the Blu-ray, but when we saw the steel book, we just had to get it. So um, that has held up really well. Like, I was kind of impressed. I thought, especially given the kind of movie it was and some of the special effects and all that, I thought maybe it wouldn't hold up so well. But like most Tim Burton things, held up really well. And kind of told, like, it got my wife on this Tim Burton kick. She wants to watch, like, all these other Tim Burton things, like the first two Batman movies and Frank and Weenie and, you know, Nightmare Before Christmas, all that. So I guess we're going to be watching that quite a bit in the future watch this week's film club pick um really looking forward to discussing that one and uh wwe obviously watch a lot of wwe they're doing a draft it's pretty interesting so andy first listener question here comes to us from daniel at reasons i'm broke special guest on episode 50 of dcd is here to discuss joker he asks Settle this finally. 
Are animes, cartoons, are video games toys, why or why not? Also, do you think the national decks will come come up Sword Shield by launch? I, I'm, I'm assuming he <laughs> means like... I Will the national decks be in Sword and Shield? Yeah, yeah. I Okay, so um, I'm going to tackle this one first, and then I'll let Andy go, and then I guess we'll discuss from there. So... I didn't know that anybody was debating whether animes were cartoons because it is hand-drawn animation, which typically... Animes are cartoons, but cartoons aren't anime. Okay. That's probably... Yeah. I didn't know it was a debate. And I'm sure there's like anime guys out there right now that would flip out for me saying that. But to me, I always thought they were cartoons. I thought cartoons were like a really big umbrella, right? And yeah, that's, like, what, that's what it is. An anime would go underneath anime that. Anime fits under there. Anime is a style of cartoon. Yeah. Typically di- Japanese, but recently. Like, uh, Ruby is an American made by Rooster Teeth. And, like, a bunch of Japanese, like, weeaboos are like, it's not anime because it wasn't made in Japan. Oh, you know, I heard that. that what, what's the name of it again? Ruby. Yeah, I heard somebody discussing that, and it was like it got super heated between uh, a couple people that I know, and I just couldn't believe that it was that big of a point of yeah. contention. And anime literally stands for animation, so. There you go. So Andy with the facts, <laughs> and me not even knowing it was a discussion to begin with. Are video games toys? I- no. I'm going to say... <laughs> so originally I felt like they kind of were like when I was a kid, I, I can kind of see why you would classify it as a toy. But nowadays I almost feel, Oh God, here we go on this discussion. But I know it's been this like discussed for really 20 years now, almost. Cause I remember right around the PS2 era, people started saying our video games art. And I think they can be, I'm not saying all video games are art. But when I look at something like Braid, Braid is a really good example of a video game that I feel is art. Or Ori. Everything Ninja Theory makes. What game is that? Uh, Hellblade. Yeah, that that's a good one. I mean, uh, you know, Ori. Um, yeah. I know it's an Xbox original, so maybe some of you, if you have an Xbox, you have to play Ori. It's amazing, and it, it and that's to me that's art. It's so, on PC. Yeah, so I, I hate to call them toys at this point. The other reason I would not call um, video games toys is because you could play your video games on a PC, which is far from a toy, and video game systems nowadays are basically PCs in a box, and I don't care what people want to say about that. At the end of the day, look at what's in the current generation of consoles. They're PCs in a box, aside from the Switch, which the only reason I don't say that is because it's not x86-based architecture. Do you think video games are toys, Andy? No. You seem like you don't. But to play devil's advocate, yeah. what about Skylanders? See, that's where I think it crosses over, or like Disney Infinity, you know? <laughs> or which, Amiibos. Yeah. I really don't think Amiibos are toys, though. And, and, like, the reason I say that is because you can't, like, really play with them, play with them. Like, they're just little tiny statuettes um, yeah. that are utilized. But uh, Skylanders, which, by the way, I own a copy of Skylanders on Xbox One. Um, really cool game. Really cool game. Like, for kids, it's awesome. Um, but they're fun to play with because you can break them apart and put them with each other and, like, mix them up. It's really cool. Anyway, um, I, I that's a good devil's advocate thing there. Uh, next one. Do you think the national text will come to Sword and Shield by launch? I don't think so. There's been no indication whatsoever that they're going to get everything in there. And I don't think that it matters. I know that there was a pretty heated debate in a Discord server that I'm a part of about this very thing. And there has been an ongoing heated debate about this mattering or not mattering for a while. Me personally, I don't care enough. I'm still buying the game anyway. And then I'll go a step further and say that Pokemon fans, the people who buy all the games, they're still going to buy it. They might be protesting now, but they will break down and buy it. 
but I don't think it'll be there in launch. And by the way, the Wait, secret they're not the buying secret it because it doesn't have the national decks. There's I I know one person in particular, um, who I will not name because I know they'll get very mad at me. I can but, be a little like weeb, like a little nerd, and be like, well, technically, Generation Five didn't have the national decks. It had a whole bunch of new Pokemon. It had like 150 new Pokemon. Well, the argument is that the national decks has all of the Pokemon from all the games, right? Yeah, like a and universal then they have Pokemon list. Bank or whatever they're calling it now, where you can transfer everything to the new game, no matter if it's in the Poke National decks. Well, the new game, you're not going to be able to transfer everything, Andy. I mean, who cares, honestly? They they couldn't get it all in. And and by the way, I want to be really clear here. I know that there's a persistent rumor that's been out there saying that the developers are just reusing 3DS assets. That's been disproven multiple times. So, like, please don't use that as an argument. You sound like a fool using that argument. They 100% are not reusing in-game assets from the 3DS. They had to redo everything. And even if they were reusing, it still takes work to get them over I don't really blame them for and and I think eventually it'll come. I think it's a no brainer that eventually they'll get the whole national decks in there, but I don't think it's gonna be at launch i i if if I'm Nintendo slash game Freak slash the Pokemon company, I really want i think game Freak's the one who's making this one. I could be wrong. um, I made every single one. Well, I know they didn't make like all of them, like the Pokemon Ranger stuff and all that. Well, but anyway, they, all the main series games. Well, yeah. So like, if I'm them, I'm really concentrating on having a successful launch with what's in the game, and then just kind of adding this. I, don't get me wrong. I realize it's a fan favorite. People want it. You got to give the fans what they want. But I'm. I would be focused on getting a successful launch, getting the product out there, making sure it works right, and then adding that in later. But that's just my take on it. I love the Andy's weeb thing. I want more of that. (laughs) I mean, if you're the only point that you can make towards not buying the game, I guess, if you want to play competitively, but just go on Pokemon Showdown and stop being being a crybaby. Yeah, I I get the point of pain. Like, it's a choke point, you know, like. When you're making a product or you're selling a service or anything, you always talk about choke points in business. And like what a choke point is, if, if somebody's not familiar with the term, is like something that a product I is like an a article and a bunch of things are already confirmed to be on the game. So yeah, there, the there's, there. there's going to be quite a bit, but I don't know if the National Dex is going to be in there. They have never confirmed that. But like like I said, I, I guess you know it is a choke point, and and what I mean by that is like you know imagine a a, a train on a railroad track. A choke point would be like a huge obstacle that stops the train completely, right? So on a consumer product, something like National Dex there not being there would be a huge cho- choke point because you know you're pushing this whole Pokemon Bank thing, so it's gonna tick a lot of people off. The question is, is it enough of a choke point? to where it's going to ruin the product. And I just, I don't think that it is right now, but that's just my take. I'm not a huge Pokemon fan. I play the games. I collect the cards, but I don't, I couldn't name them all off to you. You know, like I'm not that big of a fan, but I'll, I'll still play it. I'm looking forward to it. Are you buying Pokemon sword shield? Yeah. We should play together, man. That'd be kind of cool. Okay. Well, well, which game are you getting? Um, well, I'm going to buy both and then I'm going to take whichever one my wife doesn't want. Yeah. I'm going to tell her you, you could pick sword or shield, Ashley. <laughs> if she says sword, I'm taking shield. I don't care. As long as I get Grookey. You got to co- you got to complete the po- the, the Pookie, the Pokey decks. The Pookie decks. <laughs> I like that. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to, you know, using Grookey. That's going to be my starter. I'm looking forward to seeing how that no, evolves. Grookey's trash. You got to use, I don't know the starters. Um, I'm just messing. I just I saw the one that looked like a little chimp, and I was like, I'm. That's my that's my starter. The chimp. Oh, one. they're so innovative. Uh, they re- repeat monkey based starters like Infernape. I like that. Memeing. I mean, I like it though. I don't know. I I For love to go. I love apes. So you know, I studied anthropology in college. I love apes. So of course I'm gonna pick that one. 
Uh, but thanks for the question, Daniel. Um, great discussion out of that one. And uh, we got Weeb Andy impression out of it, even with the pushing the glasses up. That was just that was epic. So uh, next question comes from Ruben epic Jim gamer. at Cuban Swim on Twitter. He says, "Name a toy you had or item when you were little that you wish you still had today." Two reasons: is it either sentimental value or worth lots of cash these days? Due to collector value, if you had it, would you flip it or keep it? So, um, I know I just said video games aren't toys, and I'm going to stick by it. So, I'm going to say he said item. So, if there was one thing I wish I still had, it would be my original NES system and the games that I had with it. I remember very distinctly as a kid, I... So I had my NES really late into the lifespan, like Super NES had come out and the Genesis had come out and I didn't have either one. So I I stayed on the NES platform for a while and over the years, I built up a pretty good collection. I had had a little bit over 30 games. Um, Oh man. Yeah. I mean, well, there's a (laughs) lot. I mean, you know, you think about it. I had a, I had the system for six or seven years and you know, when it was Christmas or if anybody was no, going to buy me something for my birthday, saying, like, you know. Uh, times have changed. I've owned my Xbox One for six years, and I have, like, 350 games on it. Well, yeah, now that I'm an adult with disposable income, yeah. like, 30 games seems like nothing because I spend way too much money on them. But, um, but yeah, like, I had a really good collection, and a lot of the classics, you know, like, all the Marios, Balloon Fight, Zelda, Tetris... You know, all the ones that are on, like, the mini NES, basically, plus some other ones. Um, I had, like, the original DuckTales on NES. I had the Alvin and Chipmunks game on NES. And, like, I know... Kirby's Golf? Or was that SNES? No, that was Super NES. But um, I had, like, you know, some of the really good ones. I know that DuckTales cartridge is worth quite a bit now. But anyway, uh, one of my favorite games wasn't even, like, a really successful one. It was... uh, it was called Gorilla War, and it was a lot of fun. So, like, for sentimental reasons, I would want it. I know I could probably flip it for a good amount of cash, but I'd probably just keep it. Andy, any childhood? Well, I uh, read the question wrong, a.k.a. I read the first, like, four words yeah. and then thought the question was something else. Okay. Uh, I thought I was asking what stuff do you still have today because of sentimental value, which is nothing. Everything in this room has been a, the oldest thing in this room is my Xbox One, if that, which is November twenty something, twenty thirteen. You don't have your three sixty? No. The one that you threw in the snow? No. Oh damn. That was an Xbox One. I'm pretty sure. Oh okay. I don't remember that video. Um. Yeah. It, I wish I had, and there's still like this. I don't know. I guess I can steal your answer. And go with all the consoles I used to have. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I vividly remember when I moved out, I was like, where's my GameCube? And then my mom threw it away, so. See, GameCube, that, that's another one that I wish I had. Like, but that wasn't childhood for me, so I didn't list oh, that one. incorrect. I have a PS2 in my closet, technically. That's one thing. That's the oldest thing I own. That's pretty tight. That's pretty um, tight. I, I regret getting rid of my GameCubes. I really regret getting rid of my original Xbox and PS2 as well. Even yeah. though I wasn't a kid at the time. My Genesis, I sold at a garage sale to hopefully buy an N64. <laughs> and like I totally got duped <laughs> by my stepdad. He 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 was like, Yeah, um you could sell the Sega Genesis and then take the money and you know save up a little bit more and you buy an N64 and I'm like, yes, I finally get an N64. Cause I was the only kid who didn't have one, um, that played video games at school. And after I saw it, he's like, yeah, you're not getting an N64. I'm like, Oh no, I, I can't get my Genesis back yeah. now. So I, I kind of wish I had that Genesis as well. But That's... like, if I had to pick one thing to go back and get, it would be that NES dude. That's it would funny. be the NES. When I was in school, no one talked about games. It was a golden, a secret rule no one discussed where we no one talked about games. Yeah, well, you know, here's the thing, Andy. I was kind of a nerd. Like, 
I got made fun of a lot for talking about games. I got made fun of a lot for collecting Pokemon cards. I got made fun of for liking pro wrestling. Like, I kind of, like, I don't know. Like, I don't regret it, but I kind of wonder if I went back now with my 34-year-old brain and I was, like, 12 again. Would I just try to be cool and be like, ah, that stuff's lame? You would hate everyone. I would probably hate everyone. You'd I, be like, yeah. oh my god, could these kids? You'll be like talking to the teacher, and like, be like, what's your thoughts on Bill? Cl- I don't know who the president was at the time. Bill Clinton. That age. Like, what's your thoughts on Bill Clinton and you know, shoving cigars in places he's not supposed to? So that's kind of where I feel like I remember this one parent went to my mom and he was like, you know, your son's kind of like, he seems old for his age. Like the way he talks about things and like the ideas that he has, they're kind of like old guy ideas. Cause I remember when I was in school, I was like, I really didn't like Bill Clinton and I had good reason for it. A lot of people go like, Oh, you're just an idiot. You're some stupid kid. He's like, I don't like the president. Like, no, I thought the crime bill was a terrible idea. And I thought that the limitation on magazines making that a federal law was a terrible idea as well. And it didn't stop crime at all. And to this day, there's aspects of the crime bill, like the mandatory minimum sentencing at a federal level yeah. that people are trying to get repealed now. And I'm like, well, that was your president back then. You you got the super liberal people. You guys wanted Clinton. And that's what you got out of them. Um, so I wasn't really a big fan of Clinton and then the scandal came and I remember going like, well, shoot, this guy might get impeached. If I could have voted back then, I would have voted for, um, Bob Dole. I thought Bob Dole had some good ideas, but yeah, like I, I, I always tell people, man, just like try to be yourself, but at the same time, being yourself can kind of get you picked on. You, uh, you remind me of a time a teacher roasted a kid for politics. Really? And he was like, I don't like Obama. And my teacher was like, Why? Just give me one reason why. And he's like, Obamacare. And then mm. my teacher goes, now tell me what that is. And the kid just didn't know. Yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting when it comes to Obamacare and the ACA in general. So, like, one funny thing that I saw someone do was um, they took the ACA and they broke it up into parts because that's really what it is. Like, there's a lot of different aspects to ACA. And what they found is a lot of Americans that were against Obamacare would agree individually to the aspects that make up the ACA as a whole. So it is kind of funny how sometimes you can see someone's name on something and maybe you don't like President Obama, so you're therefore opposed to Obamacare just because it's it's him. No, um, I think it's more everyone just listens to what their parents say and don't have an actual opinion for themselves until they're old. You're you're right. I mean, like to a point, it, it depends on the kid, I think, you know, like my mom was really big on like, do your research, know your facts, you know, have have an informed opinion. Um, Like when I got to voting age or close to it, she kind of she always instilled this in us, but like she kind of reinstilled it in us. Like if you're going to vote, be informed because your vote counts just like somebody's who somebody who is informed. So like one of my biggest pet peeves is people who like stumble in a voting booth and then just fill it out. Like it's a Scantron Christmas tree test or something, you know? And, um, like even when I went to the polls last time and this is done on both sides, conservative, yeah. (laughs) Conservative and liberals both do this by the way. So I'm not attacking one side or the other, but you go and you show up and there's people who are handing you pamphlets saying vote for this person, this person, this person, this person, and vote yes on this, 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 and this, and no on this, this. It's like people not thinking for themselves. And I hate that. And like, I would prefer that people do what, what I do and a lot of other Americans do, which is, you know, take a look at all the facts, get an idea, especially political candidates, get an idea of what their history is, what their track record is, and make a educated voting decision based off of that. But, um, no, I just listen to Fox News and, well, you know, here's the thing. I like Fox News because you guys know I'm a conservative, but even I'll tell you, sometimes I'm like, CNN. this is hard to listen to. CNN is, they, they say they're centrist, but they're so far left nowadays. 
I mean, and that's fine. I, I think that the left should have a voice just as well as the right. But, you know, don't say you're centrist I just watch C-SPAN not. all day. C-SPAN is probably about <laughs> as neutral as it gets. Um, so, uh, final listener question comes from the troll, Colby. He says, what is the name of the boat from Titanic? Which The Lewis and Clark. Yeah, I, I, I've got to put that right up there with uh, someone who asked at one point, I forget who it was, they said, what's the name of the things in the movie Gremlins? <laughs> and you're like, what? Like, how could I you know not? I Scott did a meme one, even though I'm pretty sure he doesn't listen to the podcast. What's that? I don't I don't remember what it was. I just, he, he, he submitted a meme question. Oh, oh, okay. Don't submit questions if you don't listen. Don't be a jerk. Anyway. I mean, we got 25 votes on the poll, but I don't think we have 25 listeners. Mm, to this... roast ourselves. No, like, I I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. The, the numbers would indicate that we have more than 25 listeners. It's not much more, but it's more. <laughs> so anyway, uh, depending on the week. Anyway, uh, DCD Film Club review of The Last Exorcism. Uh... This is something that I've uh, been looking forward to covering for the <laughs> Halloween month, and Andy's already laughing, so I know how this is going to go. Uh, so <laughs> it's a movie that came out in 2010. Uh, it's a found footage film, but I thought it was done in a really cool way, unlike a lot of other found footage movies. Uh, so, Andy, what were your thoughts on The Last Exorcism? First off... Okay. Why'd you pick it? Just because you enjoyed it? Yeah. That's cool. Um, So, I'm going to be nice as your face cam goes away. Yeah, and I know. I'm you, trying to fix the choppiness. You have to review stuff objectively and subjectively. Okay. And I tend to review things subjectively more. Okay. Um, So, I'm going to be nice with this one more than others. And, uh, so you have to understand where it stands in history and why, like, why it's a thing. First off, it's a cheap horror movie. Okay. And I can't, I can't discredit it because that's mostly every horror movie of this era. Like, Blair Witch started it. You had Insidious, Paranormal Activity, um... And historically, cheap horror movies were the thing. Like, Friday 13th was cheap. Nightmare on Elm Street, Reanimator, Halloween, Night of the Living Dead. Classics. Okay. And then you have the religious horror movies. Like, The Conjuring, Devil, The Devil Inside. So, like, I don't know. It, it's a product of its era. Like, how the 30s were monster movies. 50s were, like, uh, radiation-style, like, mutations. 70s are slashers, you know, video nasties in the 80s, you know, yada, yada, yada. Okay. So it's a product of this era. Okay. Um, so I can't really discredit on that. All right. Um, so, and this is my second time watching it. First time I watched it at a party where a bunch of people were making fun of it. But my thoughts on it was uh, cinematography, I guess it, because it's a found footage movie was well, because typically found footage style movies I get motion sickness watching like Cloverfield VHS Blair Witch, like the whole running around. It makes me really like sick to my stomach. Okay. And then they don't really do it in this movie. Yeah. Um, and then it's very well acted. Like at some point you don't even think they're actors in the movie. You think like whenever they go to the hospital, the nurse that could be just like a real nurse. It's play. It's well acted for like it's cheap budget. Um, but other than that, um, I don't know. It's it's stupid. I don't like it. I okay. enjoyed it more than I thought I was going to enjoy it. Okay. I think it's a cheap scare doing the whole religious. I mean, I'm completely like taking your side of the argument from last week of Hereditary, like the ending. The religious scares are kind of cheap because you're like, because most of the population is scared of the devil. Yeah. It's like, oh, spooky, spooky. And then, uh, but, oh, I, I, for, I also like that it takes a, a devil's advocate approach to the found footage demon movie. 
where like the priest is an atheist and he doesn't like he's a skeptic and doesn't believe in it. Okay. Um yeah, I think it's kind of dumb. Well, um I kind of expected as much. I mean, at this point you know, I I think it's kind of become an ongoing joke. People that listen, you know, they know anything I pick oh. generally are going to feel that way. I mean, that's not it. You just don't pick good things. Oh, no, 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 I'm kidding. Uh, you've picked good things. <sighs> Whatever, it's just, dude. I, you know, everyone has different. I forgot. They also, uh, in the movie, they play into the stupid people slash uneducated people believe in demons and stuff. Yeah. Because when he's like, he's like, oh, I can ask five people around here. They'll tell us a ghost story or whatever. And he was like, people here don't know how to read. And uh, there's truth to that. Yeah. And then, fun fact, this isn't a thought, I guess. Whenever they start the first exorcism, the fake one, he uses, he prays, and he uses the same Bible verse the blind preacher used in They Live whenever he's getting beat up, which is a fun fact. I did not realize that. It's really interesting. So... I I expected this. So here's why I picked it, and here's why I think that this movie is remarkably successful. So you have to remember, Andy did a good job of framing it up. So I'm going to kind of reiterate here. In the 2010s, found footage was the horror medium. That was yeah. That was the cookie-cutter format. So, possession, ghost, demon. Yeah, like paranormal activity kind of was the most successful out of it. Really kind of kicked it off on a big level. I'm sure there were ones before that that maybe weren't as mainstream. I mean, Blair Witch is the first one. There you go. So um, I like this movie a lot for a number of reasons. So first off, thematically, I think it explores things like faith, which I'm a sucker for, because as someone who's a believer, who has struggled with faith, who's struggled with belief, who is constantly searching for answers because i think not every portion of humanity is like this but i think a lot of people are will always search for meaning answers what comes next where did i come from what's my destiny etc so i think this is cool because at the beginning you're following cotton who is he's a minister And he's wildly successful at doing it. And he's beloved by his congregation and people outside of his congregation. And people are writing him letters asking him to come and do an exorcism on so-and-so. So So this guy is remarkably successful. But yet he, he realizes it's all kind of a ruse. And this is filmed in like a mockumentary style where they're following him to kind of expose exorcism. You have to imagine like it's a film crew doing a documentary to expose how fake exorcisms really are so that they can kind of expose it as this middle ages style practice that has somehow like survived all this time. And they do talk about things that Andy mentioned where, you know, he goes to a town and all these people, they're not very educated, but they have all these stories about ghosts and demons and, They think the gates to hell are right there in the local town off of this road and you name it. And I think it's well based in reality because there have been studies done that show that the lower the education level, the more propensity there is to believe things like ghost stories and demon stories and moth men and you name it. So, um, it's same thing goes for like, I'm a big person. You guys know, I love aliens and stories about extraterrestrials. Same thing applies there. You know, like the lower you go on the education and IQ scale, the more common it is that someone has been abducted or seen an abduction or UFOs hang out outside their house every night. Like it's Isn't a it weird that it, it's a now thing. The phones are a thing. The UFOs don't appear anymore as much i mean it's a that's a discussion for another day because ufos are smart they're aware the phones are there you know oh alex jones well to be fair like i think it's important to frame things up 
logically, if there's a UFO and it's from a spacefaring society, they've probably already perfected light speed travel. So wouldn't it go without saying that they've probably already figured out cloaking? I mean, if you figured out light speed travel, you figured out everything at that point. I mean, I that's mean, the last in big the trajectory mystery. that our society's going in. What if there's a society that discovered space travel, but they don't have like phones and guns yet? That could be possible. I mean, I did read different it. technological advancements between different societies. I, I did read. Okay, so theoretically, if you're going to achieve yeah. light speed travel, you have to have, and I'm not saying it would be the same mathematics that we have. Obviously, it would be greater mathematics or maybe even different mathematics altogether, but you'd have to have a very superior mathematical understanding to figure something like that out. It just doesn't happen unless you're talking about it, maybe a society that becomes extinct, leaves the technology behind, a new society comes in, finds it, and utilizes it. That's another theory that's been thrown around. I don't know. Mass Effect explored that with jump drives. Anyway, Mass Effect relays, I should say. Anyway, um, the, uh, the, the beginning is really good to me. I really like the beginning because it's a guy who, he doesn't have any faith, and it tells the story of where he walks into what he thinks is a fake exorcism, you know, Nell, it, he, he truly believes she isn't possessed. At one point, the theory is that she's a victim of incest. Uh, another theory was that, you know, the, the brother was involved at one point or the father was involved. You know, that they went back and forth on that. They even said that she got pregnant by some little fella who worked at a restaurant at one point who ends up being gay. So that doesn't check out. And at the very end, he finds out that there is this satanic culture um, going on in this town. Nell's a victim of it. The father's a victim of it. So is the brother. And, um, you know, it, 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 he, he regains his faith. So I think that's a good story. It's, it's about a man who's lost faith and regains it through something intensely negative happening. So that's not great. But at the very same time, like, that's what faith should be. It should guide you through the toughest parts of your life. And I think that it's a it's a good story in, in that way. Um, as far as a horror movie, I thought the end was really dark. And I liked it. There's no happy ending. And I thought it was pretty cool how that last shot was of the guy getting chased down and uh, basically hacked to pieces. You know? Hail yeah, I, I I just thought it was you know in the sh the shoot they was shot really well and and really well done and it felt like you were watching a documentary. They, a lot of times you know Andy put um, took the words right out of my mouth. A lot of times they don't feel like actors and actresses. You know it, it really just felt like I was watching a documentary, um, which of course makes it a successful mockumentary. But then they add the horror aspect to it, which I thought was wonderfully done. Um, so I like this one. But, you know, I don't know. I'd be interested to see what the listeners think about it. It made money and it was well received by critics and uh, users um, as well. So a lot of people do like this movie and think it's successful. Um, I will tell you the sequels are nothing like it. The sequels are not done in a similar style at all. And there's not much, I don't think there's much, if any carryover whatsoever. Like I watched the second last exorcism two, And I was hoping it would be like another movie like this, where it follows around a preacher who's doing exorcisms or something. And it's nothing of the sort. It's totally different. So, um, wouldn't recommend the sequels, but I think this one's really good out of 10. I rate it, a six and a half, but it's solid. I think everybody should watch it. Five. Andy gave it a five. What? I'm surprised. I was expecting like a four or a three. Two. Two. Okay. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a. 
I don't know. There's this. There's a spoof movie of this that I've seen. Before. Really, I've seen this movie before, and I've seen. There's a spoof version. By the way, awful spoof movie. Um, well, all spoof movies are bad, but it's called Supernatural Activity. Oh, and there's a part in it that I think is hilarious, where a guy has a shotgun. And he goes, Squirrel Demon, and shoots into the tree. <laughs> okay, that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. But, I don't know. Yeah. It, it's. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I mean... I, Everything I read is sixth and up, I would recommend. This is just under recommendation. Oh, uh, okay. I didn't know we I were guess, on... I didn't know that was your scale. Like, to me, it's usually... I mean, I, not really, but... It oh, okay. Kind of is, I guess. Yeah, I I don't know, man. I I think it's really good. I think Patrick Fabian's performance is worth it alone. Um, but you know, I don't know. Agree to disagree. I it, it's the best found footage movie I've ever seen. Like, and that's why I picked it because I realize a lot of people associate horror with found footage movies. And I thought to myself, like, let me try to do something interesting. You know, I thought about a couple other movies, like Let Me In was another one that I thought about. But, um, and, and for different reasons, that's not a found footage movie. But I thought, like, what's what's a found footage movie that's good? And I really had to rack my brain. Then I thought about this. And uh, I, I just think it's brilliant. I, I think from start to finish, it's just absolutely brilliant. But Project X. <laughs> yeah. It's found footage. Um, there you go i mean some people would say the the original blair witch would be you know because it's the original it, it would be the most successful but i i really I feel mean, like this is a movie from the video nasties era that people would not appreciate if we recommended a cannibal holocaust uh you know somebody did ask somebody brought that up to me recently it was like have you seen it and i was like no i haven't seen it but it's on my list of things to maybe watch at some point I mean, it's on my list of 3,578. Yeah, and if you want to get some recommendations from us, uh, probably a lot more recommendations from Andy than me, but you can go on Letterboxd, and uh, I'm on there at Purple Swordfish, and you're on there, what, at Andy Holsey 88 No, just my name. Oh, just Andy Holsey. There you go. We have a link in the description, by the way, every week. Follow us on Letterboxd. See what we're watching. See what we think about do what, it. Do what Jared did and follow me. Write Pulp Fiction and then never get on the app again. <laughs> and don't, don't follow, follow me. Don't follow me. Yeah, let's, let's make that the new meme. Uh, so anyway, next week, it was our Patreon pick. And uh, we put it to a poll and it was really close. But our winner this week is The Exorcist from 1973, which I think is... I mean, it, it it's it's a classic. I'm looking forward it's to rewatching third it. It's a religious scary movie. <laughs> well, there you go. You kind of can't get away from it. It's October. We're doing spooky movies. Maybe Andy's final pick will get us out of that. Spoiler alert. Mm. Nothing to do with religion. Cool. Well, looking forward to it. Anyway, The Exorcist from 1973. Uh, really excited about watching that one again. Have you seen that one, Andy? I assume you have. Well, we we discussed this last week when Daniel brought it up. Oh, I'm sorry. So let's see if your memory works. I'm going to say you haven't seen it. Yeah. Okay. So Andy hasn't seen it. I've seen it a billion times. Um, It's really good. But who it's picked It's recommended it? by Ruben Jim. What? Yeah. Bobby won the Bobby poll. Bobby won the poll. He texted me a couple days after, a day after recommending it and being like, just finished the podcast. I didn't pick The Exorcist because Daniel mentioned it on the podcast. I was like, okay. And Bobby, he's the right age, like, because I, I was just memeing. So. Yeah, yeah, he's he's definitely the right age for The Exorcist because, like, if you were if you're about my age or maybe even a little bit older, um, The Exorcist was something that was talked a lot about while you were a kid or even a young adult. So. That's cool, man. Uh, congratulations, Bobby, on finally winning the Patreon poll. I know that's been a point of pain no, for No, he's him. won it before. Well, not for Patreon. Back yeah, when I mean, we would just do suggestions. I know he had something about Mary, but... Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to watch that next week. Looking forward to it. Um, 
Now, moving on to sports, Andy put this topic down as Los Angeles <laughs> Chargers are bad, LOL. So what are your thoughts on the Chargers, Andy? Because I have quite a few. Um, You win games through the trenches, and they don't have anything there. Yeah. On the offensive line. Not deep, their D-line's great. Their offensive line's horrible. And I don't They just... They're getting shut out by bad teams. A team that you picked to go to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I've... I, I picked them winning the Super Bowl as well. So I feel like a real idiot now. I've... I have a lot of thoughts on the Chargers because... I wouldn't call myself a fan of the Chargers or anything, but I do like Phillip Rivers, and I do enjoy watching Phillip Rivers play, and I think that he's going to be a quarterback that when he's gone, when he retires, people are really going to look back and go, wow, we probably didn't appreciate him as much as we should have as, as far as a player. like the, the level of excellence that he's had over the years, it's pretty staggering. But in watching this, I've watched every Chargers game this year, um, cause I'm a big Sunday ticket fan, as you guys know, on the podcast. And I have quite a few people on my fantasy football team that are on the chargers roster. So it gives me more incentive to watch it. And it's like that O line. I know they're, they're dealing with injuries, but it's, it's really bad, <laughs> like unbelievably bad. And Philip rivers has very little mobility. He never really had much to begin with, even in his younger days, it's it's hard to watch, man. I, I think it it's frustrating to watch because you see all these playmakers, right? Melvin Gordon, Austin Eckler, Philip Rivers, obviously captain of the ship. Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, to a much lesser extent, Travis Benjamin. So Hunter Henry, these are all really big playmakers, great weapons on offense that other teams would die to have. But the O line just can't hold anybody back. So I don't know, man. And the defense really isn't that good this year. Like I know the the D line is good, but their D is not playing well either. And every game it seems like I don't know if if you've seen this either, Andy. But it seems like every game they get themselves in this big hole, and they almost climb out of it, but then they run out of time. It's like the same thing every week. Keenan Allen even said it on Twitter. He was like, it's the same thing every week. What do you think fixes it? Do you think Anthony Lynn's going to get fired? Because I think he's going to get fired. I feel bad for him. There's a report today that he lost the locker room, so probably. I just don't think it's his fault. I I forget the the name of the guy that they drafted, but they've they've put some major picks into that O-line and nobody's panned out. Oh, oh, I, I don't know. Nobody's paying. Hey, a forest lamp, WKU. Well, how do you feel about? How do you feel? And maybe you could give me some perspective on this. Is it the stadium? Is that why fans don't go to Chargers games? It's the LA area. No one cares. Okay, there's no fans in LA. So then that kind of confirms what I've been trying to tell people for years there was more which is 49ers fans at the Rams game it was a 52 48 split okay so favored. I, I'm sure you watched the Chargers game against the Steelers and you saw it was a Steelers crowd like overwhelmingly a Steelers crowd not even 52 48 like it, it had to be at least 70 30 so There's, I LA why, doesn't have a football fan base I just don't get why they keep moving teams back there like it's like they didn't learn from the Raiders and the Rams in the nineties. Cause I don't, well, you don't, you wouldn't remember you, you were barely alive. No, you might not have, no, you weren't even alive when this happened. So in the nineties, the Rams and the Raiders were playing, you know, in Los Angeles. And the reason they relocated to St. Louis and Oakland respectively is because attendance was atrocious. Like, they couldn't make a dime yeah. at the gate. It was so bad. Because I don't think L.A. people really want to watch sports other than the Lakers. No, they like Kings. Kings? Yeah. Hockey. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. Maybe when they're good, but not when they're bad. I don't know. I just yeah, Hockey is insane. 
I feel bad for San Diego. They lost their team for nothing. There, there was no rationale behind them losing their team. Just never should have happened. Uh, anyway, moving on. This was a very interesting one. I cannot wait to get Andy's take on these next two topics. So the Los Angeles Rams traded Marcus Peters to the Ravens for Kenny Young in an undisclosed pick. And I heard that pick might be a fourth or fifth rounder, so it's not yeah. huge. It, it like was announced, something. but when I put it in the, the docs, it wasn't. Um, I, It doesn't make sense to me why the Rams would do this. Okay. I, get, I mean, so you could be like, oh, they're building up for the next trade. But they're... Akeem Tlaib just went on IR, their, their number one corner. Okay. And they trade Marcus Peters. Uh, Josh Johnson, their starting safety, went on IR. So they they already have an injured cornerback group, and they go and trade for Kenny Young, which I don't think will put... He won't have that big of an impact. I mean, he is an enforcer. He's, he gets big hits. He's fun to watch. But I don't think he's going to be that big. And I thought, like... They also traded for an offensive lineman, which is in the docks, which is their biggest hole in the team. They don't have an O line, besides uh, Andrew Whitworth. Um, I just thought it was a stupid trade, but then you, this trade's kind of irrelevant for the trade that we're about to talk about. Yeah. So originally, I was kind of surprised by this trade yeah. because I think Marcus Peters is a very big part of that defense. And with the Akeem Tlaib injury, I anticipated him being a, an yeah. even bigger part, but I, I suppose it was made to make room for the next trade. How do you feel about this for yeah. the Ravens? I, I think this is a good move for the Ravens. They gave up nothing and got Marcus Peters. It's a great move. Yeah, I think it's a great move for them, too. And, and you guys know, I, mean, I think the Ravens are winning the AFC North, and I think this trade really cements it for me. They have Marlon Humphrey. Yeah. I, I'd assume Marcus Peters comes in the two spot. Jimmy Smith's aging piece. Aging piece. Earl Thomas is great. Uh, not really this season, but has been in the past. He's shown glimpses of the old Earl Thomas. I mean, Tony Jefferson's hurt. So yeah. I mean, go. and Marlon Humphrey is a guy who I, I don't really know who, who would be one, two, and three in the Ravens. And the reason I say that is because if you look at how the Ravens traditionally split their corners, they move people around a lot. So, like, there isn't really a true number one that is always playing a number one wide receiver. Like, they move Humphrey around. They move Smith around. I think it's to try and keep people fresh and also give people new looks. And, and that's not such a bad idea. I also think that they kind of modify who plays where based on the individual matchups and what everybody can bring to the table. I'll tell you this much. If, if I'm facing the Ravens and you're telling me their secondary has Jimmy Smith, Marcus Peters, Marlon Humphrey, Earl Thomas, it's pretty stout. I like it. And I think, you know, like I said earlier, I, I picked the Ravens to win the AFC North. I think they still will. Um, I know a lot of people are still hanging on to the Browns. I just don't see it. And I don't think that the Steelers are anywhere close to where they need to be. And the Bengals, I mean, I think they're pretty much out of the race at this point. I think we can all concede that. So, No, nah, AJ Green's going to come back and they're going to go off. <laughs> I'm yeah. kidding. <laughs> you know... What's what's interesting about that, though, is, you know, if they had A.J. Green this year, I think it would have really helped them. I think they would have at least won a couple games because um, they played pretty tough. You know, like they were not an easy win I mean, for several opponents. 49ers, you know. Well, of course, the 49ers. <laughs> the 49ers look like a million bucks right now. They're not. Yeah. They, I mean, they're steamrolling everybody. So um, next topic here, somewhat related, uh, Jacksonville Jaguars trade Jalen Ramsey. So they finally acquiesce, and they trade Jalen Ramsey to the L.A. Rams for a 2020, 2021 um, first-round pick for each draft. So the next two firsts and a 2021 yeah. fourth-rounder. Uh, quite the haul. I realize a lot of people say the Rams are going to be you know, late pick because of the Rams, all that. But you still got two firsts for Jalen Ramsey. A guy doesn't want to be there. Um, overall, I think it's a good trade for the Jaguars. I think it's a phenomenal trade for the Rams. It's a lot to give up, but yeah. you get a great player back. 
Andy, how do you feel about it? Now that we'd talked about the Marcus Peters one, uh, Jalen Ramsey, obviously he top two cornerback in the league, arguably next to Stefan Gilmore. Um, they're hindering their future to win now, which is kind of in their thing. They haven't had a first round draft pick the past five years. They've traded all of them. That's true. They traded for cooks with the first round. Um, I don't know. They're, they got demolished by the Seahawks and the 49ers. They got to do something. The O-line's terrible. They went out and traded for O-line. Uh, and then also with the hindering their future, that kind of makes the Marcus Peters trade weird because, like, uh, Marcus Peters is an expiring contract, but wouldn't you want to keep him on even if he doesn't resign? Also, I don't think Jalen Ramsey is going to be able to resign with them just because... They're paying Jared Goff. They got to pay Aaron Donald. They're paying all these big contracts. Yeah. I don't know if they can find the money to re-sign Jalen Ramsey, and they're giving up a lot, hoping, obviously, that he will re-sign. I like the idea of pushing all your chips into the middle of the table, especially considering you just went to a Super Bowl. It's kind of a cautionary tale, though. (laughs) You know, and... Historically, teams that lose in the Super Bowl usually fall apart. You're right. Historically, they do. I, you know, even teams that do win a Super Bowl, sometimes they fall apart. So, like, you look at the 2002 Bucks; They traded a lot of their first-round picks. They had no first-round picks for three years after their Super Bowl win. And it really showed. Like, once they hit 05, 06, you could tell, you know. Yeah, do the Packers. You got to replenish the troops in the draft. I think it... I think you do. I mean, you kind of have to treat your picks like gold in the NFL. And, and, yeah. and like the other part of that is the other part of treating those picks like gold is, is good scouting and getting the right players. And that's an inexact science. But the one thing I will say is like right now, it's like a tale of two approaches. Like the Rams are all in. If they don't win a Super Bowl this year, they're going to be pretty decimated in a few yeah. years. They're not going to have replenished young talent playing on rookie contracts, which is what I think every contender has, generally speaking, for the most part. Um, And then you have other teams that are like building up this war chest that it's going to be really interesting to see how they do. So, for example, Miami, they have this plethora of picks, like a embarrassment of riches of picks, which could easily be squandered. We've seen teams do that before. Yeah. But, you know, if they do utilize those picks properly, you know, not it, to a... I don't, Andy, you'll have to help me out here. I don't see the hype with them. I mean, two is great. Um, I mean, he's a good quarterback, but he, uh, there's the Alabama factor okay. that everyone. He, is he good because he plays in Alabama or is he actually good? Um, but my point of not drafting him was like, you've seen the Browns do it for 20 straight seasons. I don't think you build a team by drafting a quarterback. You do it like the 49ers did it. You build inside out. They drafted defensive line and offensive line for years and now they're great. Yeah. I think that's the approach. Like if I were an NFL GM, I'd build inside out because you look at the best teams you know, even teams that aren't true contenders, like the Col- uh, the the Cowboys. Sorry, Colby. Yeah. Um, you know, how do they build? They got a good front eight, and they got a great yeah. O line, and then they put I mean, I everything else around. You win the it. game through the trenches. You really do. I think you're absolutely right, Andy. And I know that's a very old school approach to take, but. Look at the 49ers in their D line right now, tearing up everybody. Yeah. And blowing teams out of the water. Yeah, 49ers look great. So I don't know. We'll see how it works out for the Rams. If they win a Super Bowl, you know, it totally makes sense. And, you know, they'll be laughing. Who cares? If you win a Super Bowl, it's all yeah. worth it. Uh anyway, I'm moving also, on to NFL week seven. Wait, Andy you had something. I was like, I'm glad the news broke before. The podcast typically big news breaks after that we record the podcast like right after so i'm gonna throw out a wild prediction 
just for g- giggles. Cam Newton gets traded to the Bears before this podcast comes out. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is a really bold prediction because I I really don't think he gets traded. I think they're gonna. I think he's gonna come back as starter. I really do. The more the more yeah. I read about what Ron more Rivera says, yeah. But yeah. Um, but let's see. He it only happen. sucks because he's a vegan. Week seven picks. Okay. Starting off Thursday night, we have the Kansas City Chiefs at the Denver Broncos. Got one with the Chiefs to finally win a game after three weeks. Yeah, I don't like the Broncos. Um, the Joe Flacco experiment, I don't think is really working for them. I'm going Chiefs. Another team on a two-game losing streak, the LA Rams at the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, I want to go with the Falcons, but I got to go with the Rams. I can't go with the Falcons. I keep getting burned on them. I know they're playing at home, and I usually <laughs> pick Atlanta at home. But um, And through no fault of Matt Ryan's, by the way, he had an amazing game this past Sunday. And I saw people on Twitter kind of you know, poking fun at Matt Ryan. Uh, nothing that Matt Ryan did in that game caused the Atlanta Falcons to lose. Look up his stat line. He had a great game. Uh, but that defense is atrocious. And they've got issues on special teams apparently now as well. So I'm going Rams. All right. We have the Miami Dolphins at the Buffalo Bills, <laughs> which I think one thing is weird about the Bills is they're four and one. But people cr- criticize the 49ers all the time. Like, oh, they play bad opponents. Yeah. Look at who the Bills have beat. They beat the Giants, the Bengals, the Titans, and the Jets. Yeah, but... You know, but they're playing the Dolphins this week, so they're going to pick another win against another bad opponent. Yeah, seventeen point favorite, and Miami has never really done that well traveling to Buffalo historically. So I'm going Bills. You lagged out, so I'm gonna Bills. Move on. Bills. All right. Next we have the Jacksonville Jaguars against Cincinnati Bengals. Going with the Jaguars. Yeah, I'm going Jags here. Uh, I just. I, I need to see a little bit more from Minshew, though. I, like, he, he's got to start throwing it downfield more. When he does, he's more successful. Minnesota Vikings at the Detroit Lions. Going with the Detroit Lions. God, I hate doing this because I know it's it's a it's an okay team, and it's Minnesota, so they'll probably lose, but I'm picking Minnesota. And we have Oakland at Green Bay. Green Bay's amazing. Matt LaFleur, 5-1. and one. Yeah, I, I actually like the Raiders this year. I think they're showing a lot more than people would have thought, but I'm, I'm going Packers here. Houston Texans at Colts and going with the Colts. This is kind of a fun one, Andy, because the betting line on this one is even right now in most sports books, but I'm going Texans. Then we have the Tank Bowl. The Arizona Cardinals at the New York Giants, and I'm gonna go with the Carolina. Or Carolina, gonna go with the Arizona Cardinals. I'm gonna go Giants here. And then we have you know Super Bowl favorite, San Francisco 49ers, Washington Redskins, 49ers six zero obviously. Yeah, I got I got the Niners here. Then we have the Chargers, who have a bad season, versus. Ryan Tannehill and the Tennessee Titans. And <laughs> I guess the Chargers. I don't know, man. This is a coin flip game to me. Much more than the Texans Colts, which Vegas has is even. I think this is an even game. And I'm going to go Chargers, though. Then we have the Saints versus the Bears. Teddy Bridgewater's undefeated. They, you know, until someone beats them. I don't yeah. think Mitch Trubisky's or Chase Daniel. I don't know if Mitch is playing the game. I don't know either. I don't think he is. So I'm going Bears here, regardless of who plays. All right. Then we have Ravens at Seahawks. I'm going to go with the Seahawks, even though they play the most frustrating style of football. They don't look dominant in any game ever. Whoever they play, they could play the Dolphins. No. And they'll win by a field goal. It's so frustrating, but they win. And they're playing at home, so I'm going to go with them. Yeah, they uh, they, they never really look convincing, uh, even in wins, which is kind of weird. I'm going to go with the Ravens on the road here. I really, I really like the Ravens this year. 
Then we have the Philadelphia Eagles at the Dallas Cowboys. And both teams, I feel like, have been looking bad the past couple weeks. But going with the Philadelphia Eagles. Sorry, Colby. I can't get off the Cowboys bandwagon just yet. I think they're good. I want to believe they're good. And I think they win this game because this is a season-changing game for them. There is a lot of importance on this. I know it's only week seven, but they have to win this game. So I'm going Cowboys. I mean, I talked about last week with the Eagles playing the Vikings. They're both three and two. Yeah. And if you start off four, if you start four and two, you have a sixty percent chance of making the playoffs. Yeah. If you start three and three, you only have a thirty percent chance of making the playoffs. Well, and a loss here really hurts you. The good news is the Eagles and Cowboys are playing in a division that is really bad. Um, the other two teams are obviously the Giants and the Redskins, who yeah. are bad. So being three and three. I, I would say their chances are better, but um, I think that I think whoever wins this game will go on to win the division. I really think it's that big of a a game. And then we have Patriots, Jets, Patriots. Easy. I mean, we yeah. Have, we, we do we even have to talk about it? Patriots, Patriots, Buccaneers are on a bye. Can I just say for, for just real quick? Uh, Jameis Winston, you're killing me, bro. <laughs> Five interceptions, two fumbles. <laughs> he could have thrown two interceptions, and I think the Bucks still win that game. It's just the amount of mistakes that man makes. It's just insane. I mean, Jimmy. Was it Jimmy? And now I'm thinking. There's, I think it was Jimmy Garoppolo, but someone fumbled twice in two plays. Like, they fumbled... They recovered their own fumble, and then the next play they fumbled. It, it might have been Jameis Winston. I'll, I'll be honest with you. It wouldn't even surprise me at this point. It, it's crazy how poorly he played on Sunday, and I hope that in the bye week they can figure out, you know, what can they do no, game plan-wise to, to, to get it to where Excuse Jameis me. Winston cannot make so many mistakes. I mean, you know, well, trade for Cam Newton, uh, even though he doesn't fit the scheme. Not at all. I don't think Cam Newton fits anybody's scheme in the NFL. I think that what they have in Carolina is a scheme that literally fits him perfectly. But a lot of quarterbacks like that, by the way. Anyway, Uh, um, I feel like he'll fit with Cliff Kingsbury. Probably. Probably. But I think they're pretty sold on that Kyler Murray kid who, by the way, is playing really well. He won offensive play of the week. He deserves it. He's He's been a pleasant surprise. I was one of the skeptics. I know that you were a skeptic as well, but I know we were both on the record saying we hope we're wrong because we wanted him to be successful, and uh, it's been a joy to see him play as well as he's played, so I hope it continues. And I think it's great for the Cardinals fan base. You know, it's, it's great to have a young quarterback that you're excited about as opposed to being a Tampa Bay Bucks fan where... You just you, you have no idea what you're getting at the position week to week. Anyway, um, that's gonna do it for DCD fifty one. Um, want to thank all of our Patreon backers: uh, Andy, Daniel, Jared, uh, Bobby. I'm sorry, I put Andy in there because I saw Andy <laughs> tier in my notes. Uh, so we have. Uh, I was like, "What are you talking about?" Whoopsie. Uh, so we have Jared on the gold tier. We have uh, Bobby and Jared. I'm sorry. I have this all jacked up. Jared's on the gold tier. We Bobby have Bobby and Daniel, and Daniel on, on the, the Andy, Andy tier. tier. Thank you. So I had it all mixed up there. I'm sorry, guys. I'm reading through my notes uh, backwards, apparently. Anyway, I uh, want to thank them. If you want to check out the Patreon benefits, uh, they're all out there. For as little as a dollar a month, you get early access to the episode. You get to suggest a movie every three weeks when we do the Patreon pick and put that up for a poll. So um, check it out. Go to patreon.com slash DCD podcast t-shirts link always in the description. If you buy one of those helps us out as well. It gives us about six to $7 every time somebody buys a t-shirt. So uh, check those out. And then uh, if you can't support us monetarily, uh, you know, check us out on iTunes, leave us a review on there and we'll give you a shout out on the show because it helps more people find us. So um, other than that, you can find us 
If you want to find us on any other platform, just go to deadchannelduo.com. There's links at the top to everywhere you can find us, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, you name it. Andy, anything else you want to talk about, man? Uh, well, there's nothing to complain about. The Bruins are 5-1. 49ers are 5-0. Celtics look good. The, Carson Edwards had seven threes in a row. 24 yeah. points in six minutes. They beat the heck out of the Magic in a preseason game. So. They beat the heck out of everyone in the preseason game. Yeah, games. well, I think it's going to be a good year for them. Anyway, that's going to do it for DCD51. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.